Sportslessons.net, and today I'm going to be looking at a game from the 2009 World Cup in Russia between Gadir Gusainov and Wesley So. And uh, in this tournament, Wesley So was 16 years old, but he really had a great performance. He beat, um, other than this game with Gusainov, he beat uh, Gada Kamsky and also Vasily Ivanchuk. So getting started, uh, Gusainov is playing white and So is playing black. So he plays the French defense, which he's played pretty frequently throughout his career. And knight d2 signifies the Tarash variation. And so now um, knight f6 and bishop d3 is a somewhat unusual response. Usually you see e5 here, um, something along these lines with c5. So that's a little bit more standard. But bishop d3 uh, certainly makes sense, just trying to maintain the stronghold in the center and continue development for white. The problem is it allows black to equalize in most lines very easily. So with c5, black can just go ahead and break open the center. Now it's still possible to play e5 and maybe knight, to, knight d7 and c3 for white, but Gusenov was looking more for an open game. And so after d takes c5 and a couple of exchanges, the queens are already being taken off the board here. And so bishop takes c5 and king e2, and um, yeah, so it's, it's already kind of going into uh, a queenless middle game here. So knight d7, just trying to kick the bishop, and with b6, establish uh, you know a nice, nice pair of bishops to cut the board for black. So bishop b5 check, and now after knight e5, bishop b7 here, I, I felt like... Gusainov um, maybe should have played knight c6 to try to get the pair of bishops. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of lose some time here. Let's say black could play king f8. Would definitely be worth considering, threatening a6 and b5. And if black takes, it's a pretty equal position, but I would definitely prefer white. Let's say bishop f3, and maybe c3. He's got the palm majority on the queen side, and the two bishops, it's roughly equal. Black has a leading development. So instead, Gusenov played the more passive f3, trying to stop the bishop's scope on, on b7. And uh, a6, pushing the bishop back. So now we're kind of out of the opening, and it's it's... Kind of time for the players to see, you know, what do they accomplish? Well, it seems like Black has definitely accomplished a better lead in development and structuring of his pieces. And after Bishop d6, putting the question to the knight on e5, and after the knight retreats, um, you can see that Black's bishops are really putting some pressure on White's king side. And so, um, so starts playing pretty much perfectly here for the rest of the game. After rook c8, just introducing um, maybe some potential threats on the c2 and in the open, uh, the half open c file, and instantly with a5. So a5, he's trying a min minority attack against White's queenside pawns, and he's also trying to disrupt the coordination. And so instant uh, rook to d8. So playing in the center. So So is pretty instructive. He starts making threats on the queen side, and he instantly switches these threats after bishop d4 with g5. So he's really taking over space on all sides of the board, and what this is going to enable him to do is he's going to tie up white's position on the king side and then switch to a queen side attack. So g5 is important because he needs to take control of this f4 square. Now rook to c1. Um, white has always got to reckon with the possibility of black you know, breaking open the queen side with b4. So definitely important for black not to be too, too hasty here and play a4 because then he, he's not going to have that break with b4 anymore. So now h5 definitely makes sense. And maybe he's trying to play h4 and really soften up those, those dark squares on the white king side. So g3, white is trying to fight and maintain control of the f4 square, and simply h4. So now black has created a, a definite weakness. You know, he's definitely opened the front on the, on the king side, and he's, he's always going to have that threat of playing b4 and maybe even bishop to a6 now, um, trying to open the diagonal. 
So Bishop F2 and Gusenov really just couldn't get a plan together. It was kind of like so played too solidly, and he didn't know what to do. So Bishop F2 and the Rook coming to the H file really helps black much more than white. Because rook to h5, a very nice maneuver. And now the rook is going to have all the, the mobility along the fifth rank. So very well placed. Bishop back to d4. Um, that didn't really make any sense either. I mean, it's, it's tough to play for white because if he shifts his focus, let's say rook to g1, black can try to bust it open with b4 and maybe some tactics associated with bishop to a6. So it's very tough when... You've got to defend these weaknesses because, you know, black has a very mobile position with his rooks, especially with, with the rook on h5. So bishop to d4 just allowed rook to g8. So um, the bishop going to f2 and then going back really didn't make much sense for white, but it's, it's tough when you're defending passively. And black didn't really have any weaknesses to attack. So now simply rook to g3, taking advantage of the outpost. And... Um, here, Gusenov kind of cracked. He took the knight on d5 because it's very tough to see anything anything constructive for white. It's kind of like any moves he makes, they, they might result in a weakening of his position. Um, so moving on, uh, bishop takes. And now the two bishops, so really just perfectly shows how to use them. So starting with rook to f5, just massaging the weakness on f3 and tying white's pieces down even more. And it's important to note if white gives black this pass pawn, he's going to have another weakness on h3 with the weakness on f3. And black is going to have just this killer pass pawn on g3. So he really just, he really didn't want to do that. Um, so instead he tried bishop f2, and this seems to lead to a, a loss um, through a series of checks, which so plays like a computer. So starting with bishop c4. King d2, and now rook d5. So the rook on the fifth rank um, really decided the game for black. And so now um, white played king c1, which lost right away, and also king c2. And I think the point of black's little combination with checks here is a4. Because now black is threatening bishop b3 and rook d1 mate. And the only way to stop that for white would be to play knight g2. And then black switches with bishop d3 check. And all of a sudden, um, king c1, and black is just going to win a ton of material. Taking the knight on g2, throwing another check, and bishop to f1, the discover check. Uh, that's that's going to be it, up a piece there for black. So that's why he didn't play king c2. So instead he tried king c1 and just bishop f4 check. Um, Kind of the same thing was going to happen. I mean, if king to b1, there's still this a4 move, threatening rook to d1 check. And it's just not going to work. I mean, the position is just going to fall apart for, for white here. Um, so, yeah, in the game, just king c1, check, king c2. And after 34 rook d2... Gusenov just resigned because he's going to lose a piece. So a very instructive game. I mean, So is 16 years old. And, you know, he beat Kamsky and Ivanchuk in this tournament as well. 2009 World Cup. Um, so definitely expecting some big things from that young man. So this is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net. And thanks for tuning in.